Hello world, welcome back to this new video. Today, we are going to talk about software for once. After spending months working on it, let me present to you Zill 8-bit OS. If you have followed my work on my homebrew computer, Zill 8-bit computer, you may be aware that since the beginning of the project, I don't really have an operating system for it. In previous videos, I showed a small program where I could type commands to read memory, write memory, send bytes on the UART, or even receive bytes from the UART. But this was not really an operating system or OS. It was more like a monitor or a monolithic program. What does it mean? It means that every time I wanted to add a command or a program to it, I had to integrate the new program's code inside the existing code, recompile or reassemble, reflash the ROM and put it inside the board. You may wonder, where is the problem with that? Well, a user wishing to develop a program on his own would have to follow exactly the same steps. Retrieve the project code, add his own code, assemble, flash. But what if he wants to share his program? Here it would be problematic, because he would need to share the whole system which includes his command or his program. But other users may already have their own programs, so there is a conflict here. A simple solution to that is to provide a dynamic loader. Instead of integrating his own program to the whole project directly, the monitor could then provide a command to load and execute a user program, which can be read from the UART, a microSD, or any other storage. Cool, this would work, right? Well, what happens if the system is updated or if your 8-bit computer underneath has the same CPU but different peripherals? The answer is the user's program could break either because the drivers are different or because the system functions, such as print for example, that were provided to the user when compiling his program were moved to another location. This is where an operating system comes in. It will not only provide a dynamic loader to let users load their program, but it will also provide a harder abstraction. And this is what Zill 8-bit OS is about. With these goals in mind, my experience on Linux and inspiration I got from CPM here are the features I came up with for Zill 8-bit OS. A monotasking system, so the whole CPU power is dedicated to a single application at a time. A system divided in two parts, the kernel itself, which is common to all the targets, and drivers, which are specific to a single target. A ROM-able system, in other words, a system that we can execute from ROM directly. As a side note, the current implementation of the kernel itself takes less than 6 kilobytes of ROM and less than 1 kilobyte of RAM. Of course, it would be 100% written in Z80 assembly to make it as efficient and compact as possible. A system which presents an abstraction layer to let the user programs communicate with drivers easily. A system that supports disks. Each disk is represented by a letter, so we can have up to 26 disks. A system that supports MMU so that we have an address space bigger than 64 kilobytes. A system that supports directories and files that we can manipulate easily thanks to simple APIs. A system that supports multiple file systems. A system that supports date and time that can dynamically load binaries. And finally, a system that is free and open source. You can see the code, modify the code, share the code. And in fact, you can already find the source code for the 8 bit OS on my GitHub I will put a link in the description below. It will now become this. We have a layer between the program and the hardware, which is Zill 8-bit OS, or more precisely, Zill 8-bit OS kernel, which will respond to any request the user program makes and redirects them to the proper module. But how does a program communicate with the kernel? On Zill 8-bit OS, like other operating systems, we have system calls or syscalls. It represents a request that a program wants the kernel to perform, and currently we have 24 syscalls implemented. If you are familiar with Linux, you will recognize and guess the usage for most of them. Uh, the most important ones are open, read, write, close, uh, which let us open a file or a driver, read from it, write to it, and close it respectively. We have make dir, open dir, read dir to create a directory, open a directory, and read the directory respectively. And we also have other syscalls that you can see now that manages timers or the current date. This means that the OS is aware of the time. Finally, we also have syscalls related to disk mounting, removing files, memory mapping, etc., etc. But I won't present them all completely in this video, else it would be much longer. 
uh, you will find all the details, including the calling convention for each of them in the GitHub project. So now, if a user program wishes to print a message on the standard output, it would simply need to perform the following operations. Load a string to print in registers DE, load the size of the message in BC, load the destination, standard out value, in H, which is already opened, and finally call the syscall write. And that's it. We don't really care whether the display underneath is a UART, VGA, or anything else. This is abstracted by the operating system. Simple, right? In fact, it will be the same simplicity for opening files, directories, or communicating with the drivers. Here is another example. This is a command line program I wrote, named less, which opens and reads a file from a name given as a parameter. It will show the content on the standard output. And as you can see, the whole logic takes less than 40 instructions. How does it work underneath? Well, there is no magic underneath. When a user program performs a syscall, it will in fact invoke an RST8 instruction, which calls the kernel code. From there, the kernel syscall dispatcher determines which module should be called according to the given syscall number. The most complex and interesting one is the virtual file system, or VFS. If a program tries to communicate with the driver previously opened, the VFS will handle the request directly to the driver. But if the program is trying to access a file or a directory, the disk module and the file system will be invoked. So the VFS performs the translation between an open file, an open directory, or an open driver. What has been implemented on Zeal 8-bit OS so far? Uh, most of the features that I talked about earlier have been implemented. Some of the things are still missing though, or incomplete. The documentation is currently in the ASM code itself, so I need to extract this information and put them separately in an HTML file or any documentation. I need to implement more file systems, so currently we only have a read-only file system. And finally, I need to finish the support for Zill 8-bit computer. A demo is better than a thousand words. Uh, let's see how to actually set up and use Zill 8-bit OS. I've just checked out the repo with git clone command. In the project, we have include, target, and kernel directories, which contain header files, target implementation, so the like bit computer currently, and kernel implementation respectively. Uh, the first thing to do is to generate a configuration. We can do this thanks to make menu config command. And from here, we can configure both the target implementation and the kernel. I will use the default configuration for now. So I only need to press S and enter to save the configuration in a file. Then I can press Q to exit the menu. Finally, I simply need to type make and after a while, voila, my binary is ready and it's called os.bin. Now I can either flash it on a real flash or eeprom, or I can use an emulator to execute it. Uh, a small remark here, uh, as you might be wondering, but how is a single binary enough to have a usable system? Uh, we need to start a program or an init program that is actually executed after the OS finishes booting, right? Uh, this is true. But as I said earlier, we do have a read-only file system that is supported already, called rowTable. Uh, it lets us store any file in the ROM. And so, thanks to a driver, this part of the ROM will be seen as a disk by the kernel. This will not only make the development and debugging easier, but it will also avoid wasting the 250 kilobytes left on the ROM after flashing the OS. Back to the demo. As I've never shown the emulator for Zill 8-bit computer, let's go for this option first. I've been using Git for debugging my software for a long time. It runs locally in a web browser. All the source code is run from the web browser directly. There is no server behind. Uh, so we need to manually specify the binary to load every time we open the simulator. So I select the newly generated binary. I click read file. The small tick means that the file was read and written to the simulated EEPROM correctly. And I just need to click on continue now on the top right. And as you can see, Zill 8-bit OS booted successfully. It even prints some colored logs. We have the current version, the build time, all the drivers loaded, some warnings telling us that there are no drivers for timers and the date at the moment. And finally, it loads and executes a binary at address 4000 in hex, which is the default address for user programs. The prompt you can see now is not the kernel anymore. It's the init.bin program, which is a program I wrote in assembly. Of course, you will also find its source code in the GitHub project. Its role is to act as a command line interface. I have already implemented a few commands. 
I've taken the names from the most common used Linux commands. So we have ls to list the files. It even accepts some options. cd to change directories and ls to show the content of the file. Okay, good, but this was an emulator. What about real hardware? Well, let's have a try. Everything works the same way. That's about it for this video. Uh, there is still a lot of things to say about the 8-bit OS, uh, mainly about the drivers themselves or the file systems. Uh, in any case, you can find back all the info I gave here in the GitHub. Uh, the project is open source, you can take a look at it. As usual, if you have any question, leave a comment down below and see you next time.